In our former study of Esther 4, we had left off with Mordecai, Esther's cousin who had raised her, challenging Esther to step up to the plate in order that she could fill the role to which God had brought her into power for. Mordecai challenged Esther to exercise her faith and to plead before the king for the lives of her people. Mordecai, I mean, I'm sorry, Esther accepted the challenge. But not before asking the people to do two things. To fast and to pray. For three days she asked them to fast and to pray. And she committed herself and her attendants to do likewise. You know, as I think about Esther, I think about her becoming a queen. I would imagine that up to this point, since she was crowned, Esther had probably enjoyed a relatively easy life. She had been sheltered there in the palace from the rigorous duties that her own people continued to struggle through with each day as servants of the empire of Persia. She was sheltered from the hardships and the tough times that her people continued to face. But on this particular day, she was being challenged to step out, to step out of her comfort zone, to step out of her comfortable bubble that she had been so secure within. She was being challenged to carry out an act. Now listen to me, folks. If it was taken wrong by the king, or if he happened to not be in the right mood that day, would result in her execution. Esther faced a big problem, but she realized that the only solution for the safety for both she and her people was to step out in faith and trust that God would protect her and take her through this ordeal. You know, as Christians, just as Marta said tonight, we are being called to do more, to become more, to become more responsible, responsible to act, responsible to step up to the plate, responsible to react and respond according to the Word of God. Doing so, though, is not usually an easy task. Doing so is not usually real comfortable or within our natural realm of what we consider a normal Christian's actions, duties. But folks, I want to tell you tonight, I want to challenge you tonight to determine that you're not going to be just an ordinary Christian. That you're not going to be comfortable with just being a natural Christian. I want to challenge you, church, tonight to accept a greater challenge, to accept a higher place, to accept the role that God has placed you within. To say, God, I'm not going to be happy, I'm not going to be content until I am right in that place where you want me to be. All right. Come on. We're called to trust God and to obey Him in all things. Whether we like it or not, whether we're comfortable in doing so or not. And I'm going to tell you that comfort is something you got to throw out the door if you're going to truly function as Christ did. Amen. Because it doesn't take long from reading the life of Christ to realize that his life wasn't real comfortable here on this earth. Yeah. Amen. But in and through it all, his life was complete because he was walking and acting and living within the purpose for which God had called him. Right. When you and I get within the purpose within the role that God has called us to, it won't matter 
if there's padding on the pews. It won't matter if there's pews. Amen. Because we're not going to find comfort in our surroundings. We're going to find comfort in our God. And if we have to stand, we'll find comfort in that. If God calls us to begin to move around a little bit, we'll find comfort in that. Sometimes we have to step out of the natural if we're going to walk in the supernatural. As we discovered from the words of Mordecai to Esther, found over in Esther 4.14, God has a purpose and a plan in everything. Everything in your life, God has a purpose and plan. He has a plan for you. Whether you ever fill that role is up to you to determine to become simply obedient to Him and to surrender yourself to Him. God, here I am. Whatever it is you want me doing, here I am, God. I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to say hold up. I'm not going to say let me go home and think about it. God, I'm going to step out in faith and I am going to say yes, God. Yes. Mordecai I challenged Esther by telling her perhaps you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this and you'll remember last week we spoke on that subject for such a time as this let me tell you you are not where you are in life today by accident if you are truly living and serving within the plan of God for your life, He has where you are for a purpose, and that is for just such a time as this. God knew the moment you would step onto the face of the earth. He knew the role He had for you. My Bible tells me before the foundations of the earth were laid. He knew that this would be your year. He knew this would be the time when you would raise your hands and surrender to God and you would say, yes, God, use me. Here I am, God. I'm sick and tired of being comfortable. I'm sick and tired of living as a, in the natural realm. God, I want something more. I want to act more. I want to do more. I want to serve more. I want to be more, oh God, for your glory and your honor. Don't squander or waste or refuse that for which God has ordained for you to do. Let me tell you, lives are depending. Spiritual lives, spiritual eternal lives of people are depending upon your fulfillment of God's plan for your life. There are individuals in this world who are waiting for you and only you to come and to speak the words of life into them. And it is those words that are going to prick their hearts and bring to, bring to knowledge, bring to their understanding their need for Jesus right now. But we hold back. We wait. And we wait. And as we're waiting, millions of people are dying. And we keep waiting. There's no doubt Esther was filled with fear. But she knew that she had a role to accomplish for the purposes of God. The challenges before you right now may fill you with fear and wonderment over how you're ever going to accomplish what God is challenging you to carry out. Now, if I heard Martha right, they walked three hours to get to church. How many of you would walk we complain about having to drive around the bridge here. <laughs> we complain because the bridge is up at the moment. <clears throat> there are people in the world that are so hungry for God, they'll walk three hours, four hours, five hours. They'll go there knowing that this could be the very last time they go because some soldier may come in and lop their head off while they're there. But they go because they 
want to see God move. They want to feel the power of God. They're willing to walk in the supernatural because they understand it's not what's here, it's what's there. Amen. Amen. That's right. Simply accept the challenge by faith, trusting that the one who has challenged you is going to be the one who is going to enable you. And he's going to be the one who's going to go before you into the unknown that you will be facing. Esther's challenge was to stand up and to speak out for her people. That's, that's all that she was entrusted to do, was to stand up and to speak out. That's all she could do. The outcome was in God's hands. God doesn't call us to win the lost. God calls us to share the gospel message. It's up to God to prick the heart through His Holy Spirit. We are commanded to go into all the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. What that individual does once we share that message is between them and God. Right. We simply go and do. God, all God is asking for you to do tonight is to step out and to do the things that He's calling you to do. I want to read all of chapter 5 together, 14 verses, so that we can gain an understanding of Esther's fulfillment of Mordecai's challenge. And out of this, I want to draw out two very important practices that are revealed not only in this chapter, but we've seen it playing out throughout this book. One of these can make you, and one can break you as you face the challenge to build the kingdom of God. Let's look at Esther chapter 5. It says, on the third day, remember they fasted and prayed three days, and on the third day it says, Esther dressed up in her royal clothing, and she stood in the inner courtyard of the palace facing it. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the royal courtroom facing its entrance. As soon as the king saw Queen Esther standing in the courtyard, she won his approval. The king extended the golden scepter in his hand toward Esther, and she approached, and she touched the tip of the scepter. What is it, Queen Esther? The king asked her. Whatever you want, even to half the kingdom, will be given to you. If it pleases the king, Esther replied, may the king and Haman, remember who Haman is, he's the one that wants to destroy all the Jewish people, said, May the king and King Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for them. The king commanded, Hurry and get Haman so we can go do as Esther has requested. And so the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. While drinking the wine, the king asked Esther, Whatever you ask will be given to you. Whatever you want, even to half the kingdom, will be done. Esther answered, This is my petition and my request. If the king approves of me, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and perform my request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet that I will prepare for them. Tomorrow I will do what the king has asked. That day Haman left full of joy and in good spirits. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, and Mordecai didn't rise or tremble in fear at his presence, Haman was filled with rage toward Mordecai. Yet Haman controlled himself and he went home. He sent for his friends and his wife Zeresh to join him. Then Haman described for them his glorious wealth and his many sons. He told them all how the king had promoted him in rank and given him a high position over the other officials and the royal staff. Once more, Haman added, Queen Esther invited no one but me to join the king at the banquet that she had prepared. And I'm invited again tomorrow to join her with the king. Still none of this satisfies me since I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate all the time. His wife Zeresh and all his friends told him, Have them build a gallows 75 feet high. Ask the king in the morning to hang Mordecai on it. Then go to the banquet with the king and enjoy yourself. 
The advice pleased Haman, so he had the gallows constructed. You know, as we saw played out in Esther 4, the key to Esther's success was not in her position. Certainly she had a very high position as queen. But Esther's true success, and she understood it, she knew it, was not in her crown and her role as queen. Rather, she discovered that there was one thing that was necessary to make you, and that's prayer. She didn't tell Mordecai's associates that came to her that, okay, I'll buff up my crown and I'll put on my best garments and I'll do this and I'll do that and go in before the king. No, she said, let's start praying. Let's get down on our knees and recognize there's only one who has the power and authority to break through at this point in time. There's only one who has the ability to enable us to have the victory here. Esther told Mordecai to pray. Have all the people pray. Now she wasn't asking as a formality or as some kind of, uh, you know, idea of sounding spiritual. She knew. She knew that her success depended upon the divine intervention of heaven. Author Richard Foster has said, it's prayer that catapults us onto the frontier of the spiritual life. I like that. It, it kind of grabbed me when I read it. Prayer catapults us onto the frontier of the spiritual life. Let me tell you, if we want to be a church that's on the cutting edge, it's going to be because we've spent a lot of time on our knees. It's going to be because we have understood that our power is not in me. It's not in my words. It's not in any of us. But our power is in God alone and our communication with God, our time with God is what touches the heart of God and moves the heart of God. And it, that is, it is our prayer that is going to make this church powerful. It is, this it is prayer that is going to enable us to reach this community. It is prayer. It is you and I wearing out our knees on this carpet, praying to God, tears running down our faces, our hearts melting before God. That is what's going to touch the heart of God and make this church a supernatural church. Prayer takes us from the realm of the earthly into the realm of the heavenly. Prayer, as I have said every Wednesday night for the past four weeks is our connection to our Heavenly Father. Esther placed her life into the hands of the prayers of herself and others. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to be lifting up and praying for one another. We need to be praying for the lost people that God has called us to reach. We need to be praying for our communities and our leaders. We need to be praying for people like Kim Jong-un. Come on. Come on. Because God could break that man's heart wide open. Prayer and the answers that God gives to our prayers is the key to success in terms of heavenly rewards. Brother Rolando mentioned throwing down our crowns. That's, that comes out of the book of Revelation. Those crowns that we are awarded in the heavenlies are rewards for fulfillment of the things that God has asked us to do. And yet, as he said, we throw them down before the feet of the only one who is truly worthy of those crowns. Understanding, oh Jesus, oh God, it's because of you I'm here. Amen. When we don't pray before we act, we find ourselves very often walking in the flesh. 
We find ourselves trusting in our own capabilities. And I want to add inabilities. We are destined to only fulfill that which we can personally carry out within ourselves. We will never tackle spiritual struggles by living and trusting in our own flesh and abilities. You wonder why you seem to always be defeated, beat down, distraught, overcome, overwhelmed? The fact is, the Bible tells me you're failing to pray and to trust in the only one who can give you the victory. I like what John said in 1 John 4.4. 4, you are overcomers. You have conquered them. Why? Because I'm so great? Because of my awesome words? Because of what I can say and what I can do? You have conquered them. You have overcome because the one who is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. Let me tell you. The strongest man on earth that's ever been is still no match for the devil. It's the Holy Spirit of God living in us, working through us that enables us to have the victory. That's why we've got to learn to pray. That's why we've got to learn to trust in prayer. Victory in this world for the believer is dependent upon proper communication with the Father through prayer. The one thing above all others that's going to make you in the spiritual realm is your commitment to prayer. To commit to a life of prayer means you need to elevate your view of prayer. Understand how valuable and necessary it is. You know, I think we have a poor view of prayer. Too often we're raised if we have any prayers at all, they're little, now I lay me down to sleep type of prayers. Or they're a God is good, God is great, thank you for the food type of prayers. We need to bring prayer into our homes. We need our children to see and to hear and to experience true prayer. We need to train them to pray. We need to encourage them to pray. We need to show our families, our homes, our church, and those in this world that we're a people of prayer, that we know how to reach the portals of heaven. But like I said, too often we devalue our prayer by making it a little thing of rote memory. Prayer is talking, communing, sharing, asking of the Father. It takes effort. It takes a dedicated life to become a person of prayer. I'm here to tell you it's not easy to really pray. Remember when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying, not my will, Father, but thine be done. The Bible tells us it was, it was great drops of blood, sweat blood, pouring out of his forehead. You talk about getting serious in prayer. When you begin to get into that kind of situation, when you begin to pray for the lives of the lost in this world, when you begin to get serious with God, I'm going to tell you it's not easy. It's a struggle. It's a hard, hard thing to do. But I'm here to tell you, when you overcome, when you get the victory, when you see God come through in miraculous ways, praise God. Praise His name. Glory to His name. Amen. I'm telling you, if you've never shouted before, you'll start shouting. Amen. Praise God. It's okay to shout. Yeah. I preached in a church one time a couple of years back and a young lady came up to me after the service and she said, you know, you really don't have to scream at me. You can just talk up there. <laughs> well, apparently I got your attention. <laughs> I was never asked to come back. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Prayer is the one thing that's going to make you successful for the Lord. And if you lack in prayer, that choice that you make to not pray is going to break you. 
In various places we've read about Haman, even in chapter 5, we see in his life, we see his attitude, we see his actions. If you've been with us through this study, you realize that this guy had a, a bad thing going, the one thing that will really break you according to the scripture. That's pride. Haman's life, Haman's actions were ruled by his greatest fault, his pride. You can't be a truly committed person of prayer and still remain a prideful prayer. You can't have pride in you, I don't believe, and truly touch the heart of God. Your pride hinders you. Your pride holds you back. In fact, your pride prevents you from truly trusting God. You can't have both of these character traits, prayer and pride, going on in your life at the same time. One is going to win out. One is going to trump the other. Prayer will destroy pride, or your pride will destroy your prayer. It's a simple fact. They can't both operate together. Haman's confidence rested solely in himself. He walked around patting himself on the back, talking about all of his greatness. We've seen it in the scripture tonight, uh, there in about verse 12, 13, where he goes and he tells his family all about the greatness, all about great Haman and what he had become. Gloating constantly over himself. How many of you like to be around people who gloat over themselves? <laughs> You know, I, I don't know anything worse than to sit around and have to listen to somebody gloating over all their great, great greatness going on in their life. You know, they're their own uh, cheerleading squad, if you will, and that's all they've got going for them. By understanding prayer, which is the what I want to refer to as the antithesis to pride, we can easily understand how only one of these two can exist in a true follower of Christ. You see, prayer places the trust of the prayee, the one praying, into the hands of God. While a prideful, haughty spirit places that individual's trust into their own hands. Prayer springs from a heart that has been humbled before God, making known the needs of the person or the people who have no ability to help themselves. Well, the prideful person sees no need for help from anyone else. Prayer is saying to God, God, I'm nothing. I need you. Boasting is saying to God and to everyone else, I am everything. Haman was so proud of himself so proud of all he had done. So proud of the invite from the queen. He and the king alone were invited. Brought all his friends over. Couldn't wait to tell them all about it. Haman failed to recognize the destructive nature of pride. He failed to realize that ultimately his pride was setting him up for his total destruction. Solomon warns us that pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. How many of you know people who were very prideful and that pride led to their demise? Pastors in pulpits have Lost it all because of a prideful spirit. People all around us overcome by pride. Just like Solomon said, it ends in destruction. Solomon warns us that the one thing that has the ability to break and to destroy us is pride. Pride will break you. Prayer will make you.
If you have a spirit of pride dwelling within you, it needs to be cast away. You need to denounce it. You need to call down that spirit. You need to take control of it in the name of Jesus. Begin to pray. Begin to place yourself into God's care, into His hands, and to trust in Him. And before long, you will discover that He is really all you need. As we look at this text, as I close tonight, we find two spirits in operation. The one that makes you and the one that breaks you. Esther turned to prayer. She recognized that she was really in over her head. She was placed in a situation that there was no way that she personally could face this challenge and overcome. She needed spiritual help. And she turned her own heart and she turned the hearts of the people toward the only one who was able to deliver them at this moment. Haman, on the other hand, had elevated himself and his greatness and his own abilities and his standing before the king. The truth was clouded over by his haughty, prideful spirit. He failed to recognize his outcome on the gallows, his family and his friends and he himself were involved in constructing. Peter tells us to humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that who? He, he may exalt you at the proper time. James tells us, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. Peter and James both telling us, pride is destructive. Get rid of it. Trust the Lord. Allow Him to gain the glory for all things. You see, these two reveal the attitude of the individual who pleases God. A humbled heart dependent totally upon the Lord. For this type of individual, the promise of exaltation in times yet to come is being made. You want to gain the glory that you can give yourself today or do you desire to gain the glory of God in the eternal and throughout all eternity? You can only have one. You either are a person of prayer who is humbled before God or you're a person of pride who sees no real need for God. It's your choice. I want to encourage you tonight, church. I want to encourage you to become a people of prayer.